Our text is verses 28 through 30 of Matthew chapter 11. The words of our Savior. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, or sometimes translated, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my load is light. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we have the opportunity, which many people around the world do not, to consider one of the most gracious invitations ever offered an invitation so gracious that I do not believe we can plumb all its depth and breadth in the love of God. An invitation that is marvelously intended by God, not just to comfort us, but to lift us up and to cause us to grow in his grace. I think most of us can be said most of the time, appreciate receiving an invitation. An invitation by its various nature conveys some sense of acceptance or being embraced by another, some sense of desire to have your presence at an event of one sort or another. And here the words of our Lord Jesus Christ constitute the ultimate invitation ever offered. In considering this invitation, I propose to you five concerns. One, what exactly did Christ promise in this invitation? Two, what condition does Christ lay down for receiving his rest? Three, what are we to learn from Christ? Four, why is his yoke easy? And five, how can I know if I am indeed wearing Christ's easy yoke? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I propose that it's self-evident and, of course, well-supported in other places, that Jesus Christ is offering his rest, that word rest we'll enlarge upon a bit, both to the lost and to the redeemed. To the lost, there is an uncountable number of robbers of rest or thefts, thieves of rest. All of the thinking of the world, the attitudes of the world, the vain struggles of the world for fulfillment that can only, in the end, betray. The world is on a perpetual cycle of seeking something it cannot understand or, or accomplish on its own terms. Do you realize that there are some $30 billion a year spent in this country in the pursuit of happiness? Happiness by its very nature is an interesting commodity. I propose to you it comes only as a byproduct of seeking God on God's terms. And many a Christian can fall into the trap of trying to find happiness in some means other than that of Jesus Christ. So the in invitation for the unsaved is to come to faith in Jesus Christ to receive the rest that is for only the redeemed and to the redeemed to find rest from the anxieties to which we're susceptible, the fears to which we can be prone even after being a believer for many years. We have a capacity to bear burdens that Christ does not intend us to bear and it's my opinion that we live in a fear-driven society and that virus can often affect us. 
not just the unsaved. So it's an invitation to both the saved and the lost. So what then of the invitation to the unsaved? In John chapter 6, we find a good insight into that. John 6, beginning with verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who shall comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And in your series on the reasons for partaking in communion, and I understand this week is consideration or study number one, meditation number 21, excuse me, that the love of Jesus Christ for God is in focus. And you see that certainly in verse 38, for I have, not, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It dovetails beautifully with that perspective. Notice the word come in our text. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. First word of the invitation, come. And when you think about the word come, it involves a beckoning to come toward the speaker. It involves some kind of movement from point A to point B. And understanding the nature of this invitation is crucial. That please God, we don't despise it or regard it as trivial. Romans 8, chapter 1. Try verse 1. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Come to Jesus Christ in faith believing, and you have come to a means by which the condemnation under which we all are born into this life is taken away. Romans chapter 6. Verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Verse 22. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome of eternal life. I ask you, what more profound invitation can there be than to so enter into the relationship with Jesus Christ that the condemnation under which we all begin our life is removed. And we are brought into a relationship with Jesus Christ as co-heirs of his inheritance and promised the rest of heaven itself. And then I think 1 John is helpful in addressing another burden that the unsaved have in particular. And if you've done the work of the kingdom uh, for any length of time, I suspect you have come sooner or later across somebody who has the fear of death. And that's a powerful fear. And I can assure you that as a young pastor, first time I sat by the bedside of a dying unbeliever, it was a life-changing experience to see that terror of facing eternity without Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves 
punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And that addresses the fear that comes with the realization of condemnation that sooner or later we get some sense of, uh, even if we have not been in the kingdom or heard the word. But to believers as well, would you turn please, to Isaiah 11. Isaiah chapter 11. And verse 10. Then it will come about in that day that the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. That's to Christ, of course. Who will stand as a standard for the peoples and his resting place will be glorious. And Hebrews chapter 4, the text I trust is familiar to many of you. Verse 9 and following. There remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his let us, therefore, and this is, of course, a great text of application, be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience, of course, referring to the Israelites in the wilderness primarily. And then this theme continues on the matter of rest as a gift of God, Revelation 14 one of the most profound contrasts between the unsaved, the damned, and the redeemed. Verse 9, Revelation 14. And another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here then is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. That's a theme that is carried throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament to the New, God's people have a divine rest that the, that the unsaved cannot even really imagine. But Christ laid down a condition for the receiving of that rest. And I think it's important that we be careful to address that condition on his terms. And you find that in this brief and rich text, verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now you've seen with your own eyes a physical yoke. And I proposed when Sarah graciously permitted me to put that upon her shoulders briefly, that she was a picture of something that is, was common to the human race for millennia, namely bearing burdens. Slaves generally wore the yoke, or servants. But at the same time, it enabled them to accomplish carrying the burdens they were assigned with much less pain and difficulty. I think an illustration is helpful if you've ever tried to walk with two buckets of water, you have to keep your arms 
out to the side, which is difficult to do if they're heavy, because they hit your knees. And so the uh, purpose of the yoke is to enable you to carry that same weight, but without them hitting your legs and without having to push outward while you lift upward. So it's really a blessing. And the idea of the yoke is ancient. It's really uh, can be traced back to the dawn of human history. And Christ used this illustration, uh, not just referring to history, but something that was common in his day. And so, if you will, turn please to Matthew 10. Now we read some of the exhortations of Jesus Christ here. And I propose some of them are heavy. Do you believe that it's a heavy issue that whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven? Do you believe that's heavy? I don't know about you, but I know that but for the grace of God, I could deny Christ in a moment. If I would put in a situation of choosing between life and death. But for his grace, I think most of us could do the same thing. And how about the most unpleasant truth, that he came to bring a sword specifically and particularly to divide families. And there's very few people that I've met who've come to a vibrant faith in Jesus Christ that do not have at least some family member, perhaps a parent, a brother, a sister, perhaps a child, who has turned their back on the Lord or has never embraced Christ to begin with and resisted that gracious invitation. And unless one's heart is very hard, that's an ongoing sorrow. And so this is a hard statement in a sense. It's a, it's a burden. And knowing that God has sovereignly predetermined and decreed that a man's enemies will be the members of his own household, that's a burden I don't think we can bear well on our own. But as if that was not enough, we have the application that is so pointed that if you love father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife more than me, you're not worthy of me. Let me ask you, have you ever seen an instance where people will absent themselves from church because an unsaved relative has come to visit and they don't want to offend them? Have you ever seen that? Ever seen where we have capitulated to unbelieving family? and consenting to do something we would not do ourselves. Perhaps you believe that in the Sabbath one ought not to visit restaurants because you're encouraging the owner thereby to make his employees work. And it represents much more clearly in the light, I think, of Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20, that we're to have a compassionate heart for the rest of our servants, not just our own rest. And so here's this very clear stating of the priority. Love for me has got to come before love of family. That's non-negotiable. And then as if that weren't enough, he says, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Do you think cross-bearing is something we eagerly look forward to? I think the response to that is, oh, please. I think a person who eagerly looks forward to the pains and trials and difficulties as cross-bearing may be a bit of a masochist or a liar or simply unaware of what's involved. I'm not saying we cannot be joyful in it, indeed should be, but that's not what I mean. I mean, do we in the flesh naturally want to have affliction, difficulty, persecution, loss, sorrow, and grief on behalf of the kingdom. And I think we can honestly say, no, we don't naturally want that. And then he who does not take his cross and follow after me is inseparable, not just take your cross, but follow. And remember our invitation that we're considering begins with the word come. And the word come always implies a following of the one who's given the, in, uh, the invitation. So Jesus Christ has given an invitation that has a condition that we have to take his yoke upon you, take his yoke upon us. 
Now, I think there's a grace in this invitation that Jesus Christ wonderfully focused it, and I believe in compassion to make it manageable to us who are sheep, for we're feeble. And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, I submit that there's more to taking his yoke upon you than just learning from him, but I believe that's the centerpiece, the centerpiece of what we're to focus on. So what does Christ mean when he says we're to learn from him? Well, I propose, dear ones, that we're to learn from his example. Here are the words of Peter in 1 Peter. It's very plain. I don't think can be explained away, 1 Peter 2. The context is impressive. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, the man bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if you sin and you're harshly treated, you endure it with patience? In other words, we're getting what we deserve. So what value is there in that, other than perhaps measure of personal growth? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Now that's one of the most high profile, distinct ways that we can witness by our life to the Lordship of Christ, that when we're treated unjustly, we receive a false accusation, we're slandered, and so on, we respond Christ's way and not ours. And we now get that focus in the following verses. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Could it be plainer? He's our example, but in particular, the example of suffering without complaining and without a response of revenge or evil. So it's so Peter continues, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. What an example to follow. What an example. I believe that in the way we handle suffering, we have one of the most vivid and powerful expressions of the grace of God working in us in spite of us, when we can receive suffering and not respond in the flesh. John 13, beginning with verse 12. The words of our Savior directly. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. That's one of the I am statements that's sometimes forgotten. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. So if we learn from Jesus, one of the ways we learn is from his example. But that's not all. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus therefore was saying to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, then are you truly disciples of mine. If you dwell in my word, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. These are the words of Jesus Christ. And he specifically says, If you abide in my word. John 15, verse 7 and following. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Notice that word abide. 
can be equally well translated, dwell. Verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will abide in my love. There it is. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. So we're not only to learn of Jesus by example, but by what he said. But we're also to learn about him as described in Scripture. Back to John chapter 6, verse 44 and following. No one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So that's a third arena of learning from Jesus, what the scripture actually says about him descriptively and interpretively. And then he further narrows the focus. And I think the grace of this is exquisite. Verse 29 again. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart. Now, dear ones, I want you to think for a minute. Can any of us ever say with flawless truth and integrity, I am humble in heart. The minute you say it, the minute I say it, we're lying. Because that's an arrogant statement. Because we have no basis for ever announcing that we are humble. I believe the old Puritans were right when they said that pride is the mother of all sin. And that humility is the queen of the graces. I think that if the truth be known, we have lost, even in Christian circles, an awareness of the crucial nature of humility and its necessity. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught much on the subject. On three different occasions, Matthew 23, Luke 14, Luke 18, he said these precise words, he who exalts himself will be abased, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. In America, we have turned pride into a virtue. You see it everywhere. You see it now in the names of companies and services. When I was growing up back during World War II and the first decade after, it was generally well understood even by unbelievers that pride was an abomination we've lost that and we've actually turned that upside down and on its head and many as the Christian parent I've heard say such things as I'm so proud of my children I'm so proud of their accomplishment and I ask you who gave you the children in the first place who gave them the ability to learn who gave them the ability to be taught and to excel and to do well who gave you the ability to shepherd them who gave their teachers the ability to instruct them? And so if we take pride in our children, what we're really doing is taking credit away from God because God has said that every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Jesus Christ in his great Last Supper discourse in John 15, 5, made an astounding declaration that is an absolute when he said, without me, you can do nothing. If we really probe that to its depth, we have to say we can't even take a breath without his sustaining power. How much more then ought we to fear being prideful? And then in this great invitation, he says, I am gentle and humble in heart. This is the grand subject of Jesus Christ coming to earth from the realms of glory to take on the likeness of sinful man yet without sin and to go even to the cross to die for us. I submit 
that is uniquely, absolutely, the most stellar example of humility that has ever been or ever will be, and in all of human history and in all of eternity, there's no more glorious exhibition of humility than what Christ did. Here are the words of Paul in that famous passage in Philippians 2, beginning with verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. I love that phrase. Let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. One of many ways to exhibit humility is to really and truly, and mean it, consider others more important than number one. I remind you that when we are given children brought into the world as parents, one of the first disillusionments that we must, if we're faithful, bring upon them is the realization they're not the center of the universe. And that's a great crisis that has to be entered into with children to discover that they're not the center of everything. I remember when our adopted granddaughter was about three, she watched a dreadful program with a great purple bloated attempt at a dinosaur dancing and singing, and I love you, you love me. She took it upon herself to change the song, I love me, I love me, unblushingly transmogrified that wretched song into something still more wretched. And so when we really and truly get the idea in our head, that great truth, that humility involves others and not us, and ultimately Christ. That's a great milestone. Verse 5, now comes the heart of this, Philippians 2. Have this attitude in yourself which was in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond slave, which is the proper tr translation if your Bible says bond servant, that's a watered down translation, it's doulos, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Did you get that phrase, dear one? He, Jesus, the Lord of glory, who had enjoyed the adoration of the angels from eternity, as the second person of the Trinity, as the co-creator of the heavens and the earth, he humbled himself to become in appearance like unto us, and then even more by becoming obedient to the point of death. And as if that weren't enough, even death on the cross. That is a cosmic example of infinite humility that I believe will take us an eternity to explore its depths. It is so glorious. And so he could rightly say, come unto me and you will find rest. And the means by which you're going to find rest, particularly, although not exclusively, focuses in learning from me. And in particular, though not exclusively, focusing on his divine and multifaced humility without which you and I would have no hope of heaven. So Jesus Christ has here given to us in summary form a most remarkable privilege of, in a sense like a golden door being opened up into his own thinking of that which particularly is important to him in our lives, coming to him with the focus on him primarily as the root of the David, the stem of Jesse, as the great creator and Lord and redeemer, humbling himself. And then, if you will, turn for a moment to a couple other passages to support the brilliance and the power of that 
humility. 2 Corinthians 8. Verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you may become rich. Could that be any clearer, the exchange? And then, if you think about it, Jesus Christ said to us, as part of this great theme of humility that he modeled so perfectly, except you enter the kingdom of heaven, humble yourself as a little child, you shall not enter in. So why is his yoke easy? There's a certain lustrous honesty there. It is a yoke. I trust that even though it was not bearing a burden, and the rest of you, if you want to, after the service, are welcome to try it on, that you could feel a weight of the yoke itself before any burden was added to it. And the fact is that Christ himself says to us there's an exchange. It's an exchange that is absolutely necessary Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My load is light. And he's saying, your yoke, apart from me, is heavy. How heavy? Ultimately, to be subject to all the miseries of this life, the dominion of Satan, the dominion of sin, the fear and horror of death and an eternity and the torments of hell. Brothers and sisters, that's a heavy yoke. That's a yoke that's impossibly heavy. And so we see Jesus Christ saying, you come to me and take my yoke upon you and you will be given the benefit of immeasurable and eternal power. You will find rest. Notice in the typical Hebraic style where you say a truth and then you say it a second time with an addition. He says, come, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. After he has said, I will give you rest, having said, take my yoke upon you, he then says something else about the rest, and you find that at the end of verse 29, you shall find rest for your soul. So rightly we should understand that this is primarily a spiritual rest, although I think any pastor who's had any time in grade can tell you that when people's hearts are not right with the Lord, they can suffer a loss of physical rest. A person who's tormented with guilt, with sins unconfessed, with issues unresolved, can well descend into sleeplessness and insomnia. So there is a physical aspect to the rest that's primarily spiritual. Would you turn, please, to Isaiah 53, that great text concerning Jesus Christ as Messiah. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our griefs he bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the chastising, the chastising for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Notice the exchange over and over again. Our iniquities fall on him. Our absence of well-being falls on him. He becomes one who suffers so that we will have well-being. And I think that 
this idea of imputation of yokes, if we could use that term, is a wonderful comfort when God gives us the eyes to see it. Would you turn to Romans 9 for a moment, please? Romans 9, verse 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, verse 18, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. So what's going on here? Well, he says it's an easy yoke. You learn of him, of his humility, which was necessary to raise us from a condition of lostness and to cover us with the robe of his righteousness and to pay the penalty of our sins. Jesus Christ is saying, my yoke's easy because it's of grace. It's all of grace. Consider what Paul has to say in Philippians. The same epistle in which he has that great declaration concerning the humility of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, verse 6. Ponder this. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in you, will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will do it. Now, I need to, of course, always put the qualifier. That doesn't mean we just sit back and become a couch potato. But the ultimate accomplishment of being able to wear the easy yoke of Jesus Christ is very much in the hands of God. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do or to work for his good pleasure. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Have a right understanding of our low estate. Don't be presumptuous, but in the end, understand it's God who's working in us to will and to do his good pleasure. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 24. Faithful is he who calls you. Who calls you? Jesus Christ. Come unto me. Faithful is he who calls you. He will also bring it to pass. What a comfort. What a marvelous commitment that he who calls us accomplishes in us what's necessary to receive his easy yoke that we may indeed enjoy its benefits. Hebrews chapter 13, one of the great benedictions of Scripture. Verses 20 and 21. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, verse 21, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Marvel that so easy is his yoke that even where we have to bear it in terms of trials and difficulties, he uses even that to sanctify us. So, beloved, consider then one other element of why it's an easy yoke. Favorite passage, one we probably most of us have memorized, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Even faith we know is a gift. We teach that in Reformed churches and Reformed doctrine. 
As repentance is a gift of grace, so is faith. Not as a result of works that no one should boast, because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, I think if this has meant anything to you, to be able to ask the question with some confidence, am I wearing the easy yoke of Jesus Christ? Am I wearing it? Because I trust you do believe in knowing the faithfulness of your pastor. I believe that this has certainly been alluded to from time to time in his teaching. We have, even as believers, a capacity to deceive ourselves, do we not? We can deceive ourselves. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It was said by one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, Jeremiah, including himself. So what are some of the ways that I can know, please God, that I'm wearing the easy yoke of Jesus Christ? Well, I propose, first of all, the witness of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8. 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Bears witness. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What's his easy yoke, after all, but an honest summary of that which we bear as we are sanctified? So sometimes we have to suffer for him and with him. But that leads us to the second one, is the willingness to suffer in his company, if we could put it that way. Philippians chapter 1 refers to that again. Philippians 1, 29. For it has been granted to you for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Could it be said more plainly? I submit not. In the third place, I propose that one of the ways we can know that we are wearing his easy yoke is if we have a confidence in his promise. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For, or because I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I ask you, do you believe that? Do you believe that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ? If you so believe, you can say that's an evidence that he's given you the grace to wear his easy yoke. Because notice what is there to tempt us to doubt. Height, depth, angels, principalities, powers, things to come, and so on. Another powerful way of knowing that he's given us the grace to bear his easy yoke. Is he changing you in your attitude, your thinking? Has Christ changed your outlook? Has he changed your perspective? Has he changed your priorities? Has the Holy Spirit worked in you a work of transformation in some measure? Not complete, 
with areas still unresolved or unyielded. But has Jesus Christ changed you in spite of you in some measure? And if you can say yes to that, that's a powerful evidence he's given you the grace to wear his easy yoke. Has he enabled you to trust him when you are troubled with a problem and for which there seems to be no apparent solution? At the very beginning of his public ministry, Jesus Christ addressed that common temptation for all believers. Matthew 6. I trust some of you know it by heart. Matthew 6. 31. Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows you have the need of all these things. But first seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Beloved, I ask you, do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ does not just redeem us, but cares for us and supplies us abundantly. Now as we come to a close, there's a couple of final thoughts. Remember the invitation from Christ says, come unto me. And do you think you can say in your heart, Jesus, I want to come unto you every day. Can you say that in truth? I don't want to resist coming to you. I want to embrace your invitation and to be given the grace to follow you. Do you believe that that desire is there? And then a final one. Think of it this way. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. He calls us out of the darkness of sin into the light of the gospel. He redeems us, sanctifies us, changes us from glory to glory until somewhere there comes a point in time where we say, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Are you there? Can you say with all your heart and soul, come, Lord Jesus, to him who said to you and to me, come unto me.